Ails and Scales, The Empty Throne, Chapter 21, The Great Escape. Silvas is still chained up, humiliated, with his head hanging down and his eyes shut. He does not know how long he will be kept that way. What is known is the poor young raptor is going to be taken to whoever Bylark's masters are. A robed guard in front keeps watch, making sure Silvas does not escape or another raptor tries to break him out, as ordered. The guard continues to watch down the hall of cells filled with sleeping prisoners until he sees a hooded figure come out of the shadows. Stop right there! You are not allowed, allowed here! The new figure raises his her claws, glowing green, at the guard's eyes and whispers in a gentle female voice. Sleep! The guard's eyes flash green, making him go dizzy and fall down by the female's feet, asleep. The thumping sound of the guard wakes Silvas up in shock. He sees that the guard has fallen down, sleeping in front of the figure who kneels down, searching him. The figure uses her claws to search around the guard's cloak and takes out a ring of keys. With one key, the figure unlocks the cell and switches to another key to release Silvas down for him to be carefully caught by his hooded rescuer. Who are you? What is going on? He asks as he is placed back on the ground, standing. We, we, we are getting out of here. We have no time. The figure says with a familiar sweet voice. Silvas turns around, flexing his wrists, facing the figure, looking directly into her hood to see her face. Oh, oh, see ya, Silva says sternly, giving her a look, not trusting her. The figure puts down her hood, revealing herself to be Osea, looking guilty. I know you're mad at me right now, but one, I swear to the spirits, I do not know I was being used as a spy. And two, I'll explain everything when we get out of here. And why should I trust you this time? Silva softly demands. Because she helped me, son. A familiar, exhausted voice of a mid-aged lady says, Silvas tilts his body to see his mother, Silvira, coming out of the shadows. She does not look well, as her once beautiful light blue mane is dirty and messy. She is not wearing her beta lady cloak and crown and jewelry, with the exception of the locket around her neck. She carries a wooden staff, trying to keep herself up. As she gets close, she begins to lose her balance. Mother! Silvas rushes past Osea and catches his mother before she falls on the ground, dropping her staff. Silvas holds his mother in his arms, seeing her turn her head weakly, looking at him, panting with a smile. My son, you're here. She puts a claw onto Silvas' cheek, who in turn has a hopeful smile, looking at her with tears. He is so glad to see her again after being separated for so long. I made it to pad a lot, Mom, he sobs. I was going to get help from Arcus, but I got kidnapped, he tells her with more tears. Your special friend told me everything while releasing me from my cell to rescue you. I could not be any, any prouder, Silvira softly tells him as she gets back up using her staff like a cane. She turns her gaze to Osea with a grateful smile. Silva sees Osea blush nervously, looking side to side. I don't mean to interrupt the reunion, but we have to get out, of, get out of here. She reminds them. Knowing she is right, Silva's exchange a quick look with his mother, nodding with her. Then he lift, lifts his mother into her, his arms to carry her, believing she is not in any condition to keep moving. With his mother in his arms, Silva follows Osea believing she knows her way around the dungeon. Toward the end of the hall, they stop by a sturdy stone door with bars for Osea to peek through. She uses another of the keys to open it up, while Silvas continues to hold his mother. Why, we stop? Silvira asks weakly, still holding on to her son. 
I believe you you guys need to get back your things. Osea answers as she opens the door for Sils and Sil- Silviera to enter. Turns out it is the evidence room where a prisoner's belongings are confiscated. The room is a large square filled with chests. Silvas gently lays his mother against the wall right by the entrance and tells Osea, who gives him the keys to stay, to stay by her to keep watch. Silva searches through the wooden chests one by one using the keys that Osea ga- gave him. With each chest opened, all he can find is mostly clothing or possibility stolen items. He finally opens a chest with his belongings, a black leather surus, gauntlets, and a long blue hooded poncho. Silvus quickly puts on his equipment and runs back to his mother, who is resting on a wall while Osea stands by the entrance, holding the staff she collected from Silvira, keeping watch. He picks up his mother once again, letting Osea know that he found what he is looking for. All three head to another door where they must climb down a circle of stairs down. The climb down the stairs is long due to the dungeon being at least 10 stories tall. The trio makes it to the ground floor only to be met by three Manchester guards who are patrolling the hall, forcing them to stop in their tracks. The guards draw their spears and are about to alert the others, only to be pushed off to the walls by a gravitational force by Osea who thrusts out both her claws to knock them out. However, they hear a shouting voice from the other sides of the hall and turn their gazes. The prisoners are escaping! A swarm of guards is seen charging at them from all sides with spears at the ready. Osea tells Silvus and Silvira to head back to the circular staircase, believing she knows a secret escape route at the third floor. As they run run up back on the stairs, they can hear running feet of the guards on their trail, or tail. When they enter the third floor, Silvas takes a sniff of terrible smell. Wherever the awful smell is coming from, might be coming through the metal bars on the rows of stone doors. Yuck! Where are we that this hall smells so bad? This is the sewage hall, where we do our business. Osea covers her nose, looking sick as she guides Silvus and his mother further down to another door which will lead them to the dungeon sewers. Osea opens the door to reveal a tunnel entrance resembling a giant pipe. Silvus, still holding his mother, peeks inside the tunnel looking uneasy, along with Osea who joins as well. The This pipe is going to take us down to the sewers, is it? Silvus asks, looking disgusted smelling more of the stink inside. He would cover his nose, but he has to hold on to his mother, who is in his arms, looking fatigued. Unless you want us to get captured, we have no other choice. Osea states, just as uneasily, looking like she is going to vomit from the smell. The two take a quick look into the pipe, hesitant until they hear the voice of the guards shouting, Here they are! Don't let them escape! Both guards, both raptors, turn their heads in shock to see the guards running down toward them fast. With no options, they jump into the pipe, sliding down into the smelly sewers. The guards, who are chasing them, stop in their tracks, hesitating to go after them, not wanting to fall into the sewers. Instead, they decide to find Targan and warn him. From the outside the dungeon, Silvus and Osea find themselves coming out of the sewer tunnel to be greeted by a wide grassland filled with patches of tall grass with glowing flowers. While the mist wisps are seen flying around the night sky filled with bright stars, a pair of green mountains can be seen from a distance which borders between where they are and Magalo. They are in Manchester, Osea's home baitedom and the land of enchanting, a school of mistcraft involving using mist to craft mystical objects. Osea and Silas have their breaths held coming out of the sewers. They both gasp in relief as they can finally breathe the fresh air. 
Silvus begins to feel movement in his arms, getting his attention. By the spirits, what was that awful smell? The voice of Silvira is heard as she squirms in Silvus' arms. Silvus looks down to see his mother slowly open her, open her eyes halfway, looking at him. He makes a nervous smile and tells her that they just come out of the sewers to escape, which only makes her squirm, looking disgusted. Do you know a quick way back to the capital? Silvus asks Osea. Osea scans around the grassland to figure out where they are. With a claw to her squinted eyes, all she can see are sleeping herds of stegos and mayas gathered around, either sleeping or eating the tall grass and wild fern trees, until she sees the world tree of Padalot from a distance. Beaming, she tells Silvus to look and points at the tree with the staff in her claw. Silvus walks up to her, carrying his mother, to see the tree with a hopeful smile. The biggest blessing of a capital city being built under a giant tree is being able to find it when not following the mystery. Silvus whispers to his mother that things are going to be okay and is about to walk off with Osea until a familiar, familiar serious male voice calls out, Osea! Silvus and Osea stop in their tracks to see Targan above the wall of the main gates of the prison with a swarm of guards and Bylark with them. Targan has a mixed expression of anger and disappointment. Osea walks past Silvus and his mother to face her brother, looking like she's about to cry. You used me! I believed you! I defended you when Cousin and Silvus told me that you led a hostile invasion by force! Osea shouts with tears coming out with her eyes, showing how heartbroken she is. Cousin, I was not the only one who told her? Silvus thought as he watches Osea, giving a piece of her mind, calling out her brother's actions. He continues to hold on to his weak, weakened mother, at the same time continuing to listen to the sibling's argument. Targan and Osea go on and on, justif justifying each other's actions. Targan looks like he truly believes that he wants to bring back order to Avalonia. Yet, Osea keeps pointing out that he is only causing more suffering in the kingdom. I am doing this to bring, bring this kingdom back to normal, shouts Targan. By making a deal with an evil dark miscaster? Allowing his goons to harass other raptors? Osea sobs and wipes her tears with a piece of her cloak. I can't keep following your misguided ambition anymore, Sage Gorm, Auntie Doe. Cousin Buck and Silvus were right. Sister, Targan gently says, slowly turning his face in a form of guilt. Silvus can see that Targan also is also heartbroken by Osea's words. Targan must be getting pressured on what to do with his own sister. He turns around with eyes closed, looking down. The guards take notice and check on their beta lord to see if he is okay. Osea also turns around, still putting a hurt face, returning to Silvus and o Silvira. Are you going to be okay, Osea? Silvus asks her. Osea only closes her eyes, taking one more peek at her brother and the guards while Bylark only looks at them. She turns her gaze back to Silvus, telling him that she wants to get away from the dungeon as soon as possible. With that... The two with Silvira still in Silvus' arms begin their journey back to the royal capital. While they leave further into the grasslands, Bylark turns his stern face to Targan, who is looking down, conflicted in his feelings. Bylark warns him that the prisoners are getting away, but Targan just shouts, You deal with them! and turns around to retreat into the keep. The dumbfounded guards turn their attention to Bylark, who is waiting as if he has his own orders. Bylark turns his gaze back at the fleeing prisoners, making a sinister smile, ordering them, Release the Carnotaurs. Since escaping, Silvus finds himself leading back to the Padalot, to Padalot at a rapid pace, with his mother resting in his arms. Osea follows suit, 
keeping up the pace ever since she decided to leave her brother. There is no telling how long the trio have been crossing the grasslands, but at least 21 sunrises have passed. Traveling without mounts proved to be tiring. One moonrise, the trio decides to make camp, right by a lake surrounded by herds of herbivore dinosaurs who are just sleeping around, guarding their nests. Sitting around the campfire, Silva sits next to his mother, who does not look better, lying on a pile of grass. He finds himself keeping an eye on her, worried, stroking her head with his unburned claw. Her once beautiful teal scales have turned dull. Whatever Bylark and his goons have done to her seems to be affecting her health. He looks to Osea, who sits opposite from him by the campfire, looking down guilty. The poor girl must think Silvas is still mad at her for unknowingly deceiving him. He cannot completely blame her for being used as a tool. Osea had her eyes raised up, looking like a shamed puppy, making her look adorable. The tears slowly coming out shows she is not fooling. She is truly sorry for what has happened to him, and she does not have the amulet an anymore, so Targan and Bylark won't track them. Silvas, she whimpers slowly. Silvas slowly looks back to his mother, who is slowly br breathing, barely. So you're part of the Anvar clan. Why did you not ever tell me? He softly demands, still keeping his eye on his mother. I wanted to tell you, but my brother, Targan, made me bow to never tell any raptor outside Manchester about our connection. She keeps sobbing. He is my brother, took care of me when father died when I was young. I trusted him. Silva slowly turns his gaze, still looking serious, away from his mother. He watches Osea break into tears, still heartbroken. He has a bit of a hard time believing her, yet the emotion is real. It sums that she really did not know that she was being used as a spy, not only by Lark, but her own brother. He wonders if Targan was always the strict male that he is today. So he asks her, What was Targan like before all this? Osea stop, stops her crying, looking up to Silvus. She still has tears coming out and is making a few sniffs. He wasn't always that close-minded, you know. When my father was still alive, Targan was a very chivalrous, chivalrous male. He always looked up to father. He wanted to be a great knight, just like him. When I was bullied by other raptor nobles, he would always rush to my aid like a knight of old would do. Osea makes a small smile, looking at the night sky, filled with stars. One day, when I turned seven, father went on a mission to stop a bandit attack. Targan took care of me until he returned. A messenger came by with grave news that father fell in battle. Targan was devastated as was I, since father was the only parent I knew. Osea saddens, looking down back at Silvus, who was still looking at her back, keeping his claw on his mother's head. After father's funeral, Targan, being next in line for Beta Lord's throne, was coordinated by the end of the seventh sunrise. As long as he did not have heirs, it lived, leaves me, taking his place as first delta. He did not look happy when he took the mantle as the new beta lord of Manchester. Probably he could not get his mind off the death of both father and mother. I did not know mother personally, but my aunt Elmar Doe, my father's younger sister became like a mother figure to me. She told me to give Targan space to get over his grief. So I took Auntie Doe's advice and gave Targan space. <laughs> Things looked better as he performed his beta lord duties well. But once in a while, I see him stressed after doing requests involving fighting bandits. The more he fights crime, the more he shows that he's getting frustrated.
frustrated with the lack of aid from the mystatorium. I even overheard him rant about it in his quarters one night, praying to the spirit for a solution. One day at a court session, a miscaster visited us, claiming to have a solution to the problem. That miscaster was Bylark. He looked friendly at first, but the way he spoke at court, Tarkin seemed intrigued, but I sensed some dark aura within him. I sensed it when Bylark came up to me to give me that accursed amulet as a gift. Sage Gorm probably did too, as he tried to warn my brother about it. Tarkin ignored his warning and decided to let Bylark prove his worth. Since then, I have been hearing that crime is starting to fall in Manchester. Whatever Bylark did, it pleased my brother, but the sage did not like it. One night, I overheard arguing between Targan and Gorm about Bylark. I was worried about what Bylark did that upset Gorm. Osea makes a shiver through her spine and continues with her story. The next sunrise during court, Target announced that he exiled Sage Gorm to re- be replaced by Bylark as the new court miscaster. Since then, I have been I have seen Target preparing a massive army with Bylark's help. I saw him make a speech to all the raptors of Rookingrad about his ambition to bring Avalonia back together, <laughs> claiming that the Mystatorium is corrupt. Pleasing many raptors, as there there was a lot of anti mystatorium rhetoric. Sounds like Bylark was trying to get close to your brother in order to convince him to turn on the mystatorium, Silvas butts in, earning a nod from Osea in agreement. She explains the rest of her story to him. Her brother eventually came up to her, telling her about his great ambition to restore order in Avalonia. She even tells him how Targan eventually had her go to Athera for an errand, which is how she and Silvas met without her knowing she was being used as a spy. Seeing that it is getting late, Silvas and Osea decide to sleep until the ground begins to shake under them. Silvas looks around to see a stampede of frightened stegos running from a hill. They seem to be running away from a predator native to Manchester. Squinting in his eyes, Silvas spots a pack of four large theropods that look that almost look like a Tyranno Rex, except they have longer arms and a pair of long horns on, on their brows. They also wear armor, showing that they are domesticated for war, but the way they are sniffing for a specific target. Silvas looks to, to Osea, who in turn slowly walks up to his side with bulging eyes of fear at the sight. Osea, we better run. War, Carnos! He shouts, rushing to his mother scooping her up into his arms and running as fast as he could with Osea following suit, terrified. The shouting sound of Silvas' voice causes the war carnos to spot them. The one leading rises up, making a brief roar. Then they all begin their chase for the targets they are trained to hunt. Being domesticated war dinos, they ignore the nearby frightened herbivores, keeping focus on chasing Silvas and Osea, who are running for their lives. Running for his life, Silvas holds onto his mother tightly, not wanting to leave her behind. He looks behind to see Osea running along, panting with each step. Behind her, he sees the Carnos in the, in the open, continuing to chase after them, making his heart race fast in fear. He and Osea continue to run, avoiding the frightened herbivores that run along the, in the in middle. Can't you use your miscraft to fight them? Silvas shouts to Osea. I only know non-lethal powers like gravitation, illusionary, and life bending. I never really liked learning powers to take lives. Osea shouts back, taking one more peek behind, seeing the Carnos. Why can't you use your power? My claws are occupied holding my mother right now, Silvas yells. As much as he wants to use his powers to defend himself, he cannot risk hurting his mother. They only run into a border wall to Saronian heart, with no gate at sight. Silvas and Osea are cornered, turning their heads to see that the Cardinals are about to catch them. Silvas gently, gently leans his mother down against the wall, 
when he flares electricity in his claws, preparing to, to zap the Carnos, while Osea runs behind him, looking helpless. One of the Carnos is about to strike Silvus until it gets hit by a long purple mist arrow through its head, killing it. The Carnos turn their gaze while Silvus and Osea turn their heads to the left to see where the arrow came from. In their sight, they smile at a cavalry of ten armored raptor knights to their rescue, riding on their mounts. They are the Knights of the Mist. They all have their associated mist weapons drawn, like the ones with a bow and arrow at the ready. Shooting, an, shooting another at the other Carno by the eye, staggering it while the other nine take out the three by Snaguana back. One knight throws a misted halberd like a javelin right at a carno's heart, killing it directly. Another knight leaps off his mount, using his misted sword to impale it right on the, on the head of the one with the arrow to the eye. The final carno tries to swish its tail at the knight with a misted claymore, only for the knight to dodge it. He counters by slicing off, slicing the tail off. The Carno scree screeches in agony, only to be finished off by an arrow to the neck and falls down to the ground, making a big thumping sound. The knights approach Silvus and Osea, who in turn look relieved. They have covered helmets with a bush of sky blue feathers on top, not knowing which knight is who. One knight with a bow walks up to Silvus on a familiar colored snaguana, telling him, Looks like this is the third time I had to save your tail, cousin. The particular knight's voice sound, sounds familiar. Silvus gasps with a smile, both glad and disbelieving, knowing who the knight is. Eco? He guesses. The knight gets off his mount, walking up to Silvus. He takes off his helmet to reveal the familiar teal-faced raptor with a shorter brushed bl back blue mane with a beaming face. That's Sir Vessel Eco, kind sir, as I have officially joined the Knights of the Mist. End of chapter 21. If you like my content, please subscribe, leave a like, and a comment. Ciao!